great generosity, you brought the world into being and gave it life. And then you gave it yourself on the cross of human suffering, such priceless and painful giving. Eternal God, out of your great generosity, make us generous, bring us into being. And in your name, bless these offerings, the fruits of our daily labor, and inspire us through your spirit to use them to make this world a better place and to see it as you do and to love it with your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Oh, I remember. May I say one other thing? Yes. I had friends. Eli was able to go home and the mass was benign. Good. Yay. Our reading this morning comes from the Old Testament on Psalm 146. Second reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 14 to 21. <coughs> Let us pray. Liberator Christ, you came into a holy place and read the sacred word about giving sight to the blind and freedom for the prisoners. Come to this place now. Read these words to us until our own eyes are opened, our faith is unlocked, and we can see the world as it is and as it, as it could be. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord, O my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Do not put your trust in princes, in mortal men, who cannot save. When their spirits depart, they return to the ground. On that day, their plans come to nothing. Blessed is he whose help is in the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord, his God, the maker of heaven and earth, the sea, and everything in them, the Lord who remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the alien and sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the ways of the wicked. <coughs> the Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. <coughs> And Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, and what, as was his custom, and he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, <coughs> gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. 
And he began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. Amen. La palabra de Dios para el pueblo de Dios. Gloria a Dios. Sometimes, not always, but sometimes, and not because I'm lazy, but sometimes I intentionally don't have an ending on my sermons because, um, I don't know, sermons don't necessarily have to have an ending, it seems to me. And also, sometimes I like to sort of let them evolve as I begin preaching. This sermon um, had sort of an ending, but as you know, there are no there are no. Um, uh, coincidences, and um, I received this magazine in the article um, a few minutes before uh, 10 o'clock, and uh, as you well know, Jackson Kaguri is a very devout Christian, and the way he interprets his relationship with Jesus Christ is, is the answer, if you will, or is the um, conclusion of this morning's meditation. Okay? So mm -hmm. what I'm saying is, is very simple. I, sometimes, and I, I'm not, I don't know if I hear it from anybody here, but I hear some people say, oh, I worry if I'm going to heaven, or I worry if I'm being a good Christian, and I worry if I'm doing the right thing. Well, if you behave like Jackson, then you don't have to worry anymore. Who we believe Jesus to be as Savior has much to do with the way we were raised. You have heard me talk about this before, but it is true. It has much to do with what we were taught by our parents, our teachers, and our preachers. This, and most often, our views of Jesus are defined by our social and cultural foundations. Now, once again, uh, sometimes people get annoyed because it seems like I keep hitting on this. And I do because I'm not sure people get it yet. We, we are defined by what we're told to be, really, throughout life, by our parents, our schools, and our religious uh, institutions. <coughs> They're the ones that inculcate us. They're the ones that tell us how to behave. They're the ones that threaten us if we don't behave. It doesn't matter if our parents or if our teachers or if our religious institutions are telling the truth. What matters is that we're obedient. And the way we're raised is, is frankly, pretty much the way we end up thinking uh, spiritually, if spiritually at all. If, for example, one is brought up at home in a religious community, that stresses fear of hell, guilt, and shame, that person will evolve a view of Jesus radically different than mine. I grew up, thank God, I grew up in a home that emphasized the nurturing, forgiving, and sobering joy of a life with Christ instead of fear of damnation and hell. I am so grateful for that because I don't suffer guilt. I don't suffer shame, and I don't su suffer fear. And I feel very sorry for people who do, and yet the sadness is it's virtually impossible to break somebody out of a shame-based life that they have been taught since they were that big. 